All right, guys, welcome back to the Punching In podcast here with Daniel after an exciting, actually two weeks, but we'll just keep it to this weekend. Um, amazing weekend of fights. Wow. If you're a, if you're a f- fight fan and obviously having ties to the sport with our team, it was just that much magnified for us. Um, just tremendous. And we might as well just jump right in and cut through the chase and just talk about this barn burner of a fight between Mateus Gamrot and Armand Sarukian. And just two guys, Dan, that are just at the, I'm going to say at the peak of their career, maybe not even yet, because I'm not sure Armand hit his peak yet. At 25 years old. Yeah. And Gamrot at 30, both guys just at the forefront of that division, I think, just future stars, future champs, whatever you want to put on them. And the fight lived up to everything about it. So I'm just going to throw it over to you. What are your thoughts, uh, man? You, you say future stars. I mean, they're, yeah. they're stars now. Yeah. Future champs, I would I would be willing to guarantee that they both fight for a title in the UFC during their career. And I would not be surprised if those guys both wear that title at some time in their future. Those guys are that good. I think outside of Islam, they would be favored against everybody else in that division if they fought next month. Wow, so you're, it's a big statement. So you're saying that either one, if they fought Charles Oliveira next, who's the champ, or is he the interim champ? Or no, is Charles he, is the champ. champ. Um, they'd be favored over They'd be favored I would, over him. Wow. I would, I would be stunned if they weren't. And when, when Charles fights Islam, <clears throat> which hasn't been announced yet, but everybody thinks that's right. the next fight. It's the fight that makes the most sense. And I'll put a caveat in here. Charles Oliveira is my favorite fighter to watch. He has been for years. The guy is so dynamic. He can finish fights standing on the ground between back. between the ground and standing in a scramble. He's the most fun guy there is to watch in the UFC. But I think he would be a prohibitive underdog against either one of these two. Prohibitive. Guys. And wow. I think and I think I think Islam's gonna be a substantial favorite over him when the line comes up. Just because style it's, matchup. It's hard to win fights from your back. Charles can still do it. Ortega can still do it. I don't know if there's anybody else that can really do it against that level of competition these days. But uh, I think I don't think there's a fighter in the UFC other than Islam that would be favored over one of those two guys. Hmm. And I wouldn't be surprised if those guys would beat Islam. I mean, ugh, those two guys are fucking good. And <laughs> we it's not a surprise to us because we've seen them both train. Yeah. They both spent a lot of time here at ATT, which is – why I was so against this fight and did everything I could to try to stop this fight from happening because in my mind, I thought that's the way this fight's going to go. It's going to be crazy competitive. It's going to be crazy close. They're both going to show what they've got, but because they're doing it against somebody who's ranked just outside the top 10, they're never going to get the credit that they deserve. I may have been wrong on that because the fight world is buzzing over the fight and they're (laughs) beaming over both guys. Right. Um, But I just would have liked that when one of them inevitably had to lose because they fought each other, I would have rather been when they were ranked four and five instead of ranked 11 and 12. Agreed. But what a fight. Yeah. Um, you know, we broke the fight down before, and in my mind, I thought Armand is a better wrestler um, and Gamrot's a better grappler. And I was really curious to see this play out. And my takeaway from that portion is I still think Armand's a really good wrestler and a good grappler, obviously. And I just think Gamrot showed he's a really good wrestler as well. Um, Dude, Gamrot's sprawls, Gamrot scrambles, rolling out of shit. Yeah, his, when they were double his Grambies ducking under for like a knee bar to try to sweep it and create How a about scramble. Double Wizards faces in the mat yeah. trying to rip each other's shoulders out. It's like holy shit! The first Ar- round, the Ar- first couple minutes Ar- of the fight, Ar- you saw Armand's, those scrambles. Ar- I don't mean to interrupt you, but Armand's. Take down defense by just saying, sure, take my single leg, shove it behind my ear, and you're still not going to take me down. Un- Multiple times. Unbelievable. Yeah, and then, like, in the fourth or the fifth, I think it was the fifth, when Armand did the same to, Ga- to Gamrot. Yes. And, lay- and Gamrot's bouncing, bouncing. And punching. He's, and he's punching. Right. It's like, man, yeah. those two guys are amazing. I was equally impressed by both. I mean, at the at midway through that first round, I'm like, there's no way they can keep this pace. Yeah. There is no fucking way... They can keep this pace. And I was also thinking, having talked to both guys leading up to the fight, I knew how confident they both were in their own abilities. And I think they were so uber confident in themselves that they both thought it would be an easier fight than it was. Yeah, we, we talked about that. And I, I said to you before, I said, I wonder if like either guy was really <clears throat> surprised at how good the other guy was. Because you 
you see the guy in the gym, you hear about the guy, you hear how how good he is at certain things, but until you lock up with this guy, collar and elbow, you know, you you don't know how strong the guy really is. You and know, they how quick never, they, he is. They never matches. trained together yep. in our gym. They never so, they never did. I, so. I'm just curious if either guy came away and says, Oh shit, he's a little bit better wrestler. Oh shit, he's a better grappler. He's, I know. think they were both surprised at how good the other one yeah. is. More so not because they were underestimating the other guy, just because they're so confident in their own abilities. And during and that first be. round, during that first round when it was just so neck and neck and just crazy pace, crazy scrambles, guys really going all out and not being successful with 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 some of their game. <laughs> I, I I'm saying to myself, a they can't keep this pace up, and I'm wondering is somebody going to crack a little bit just because they're surprised that holy fuck they, I'm, this is going to be a war? Um, maybe not the type you know slobber knocker war while right. you're sitting there just taking each other's heads off. Um, but just a war, a technical war, is somebody going to crack a little bit? <laughs> Answer is no. Yeah, the, neither one of those guys was cracking. Yeah, you watch the, the entirety of that fight and you just walk away and say the tenacity on both guys was just through the charts. I mean, like you say, nobody broke in that fight. That wasn't about breaking. That was just about who survived, who was able to push and dig a little bit more in those fourth and fifth rounds. Um, amazing, amazing fight. And, and I know there was some stuff out there on the internet. Oh, this is a robbery. This Man, those rounds were close. That was a close fight. Uh, both guys deserve to win that fight. And um, just, you know, we, we walked away from this fight obviously not wanting it to happen. And, and all we said was just I hope it's a fight of the night and both guys really shine. And that's exactly what happened. So Yeah, you said uh, nobody deserved to lose. I, I, I'm not sure who won, but I know nobody lost. Yeah. You know, and, and it's... It's so rare that you have a fight where both guys come out better and with more star power and more hype behind them than they had going in. It's hard because somebody's going to lose. Yeah. You know, but they did. Both of those guys proved that they are top, top right. of the heap. Yeah. We, we, or you talked about that before on the show where coming off a loss doesn't necessarily mean it drops you down. Calvin Qatar, right? Uh, Max Holloway coming off a loss. I mean, th those guys had some epic fights with, you know, Volk and, against themselves and they still their pedigree stayed where it's at you know they're but it's rare yeah it's hard to do that it is agreed um it's funny after the fight then i was buzzing obviously you were too just an amazing fight and i typed out holy fuck you know with the little emojis in there for the word fuck <clears throat> and uh what a fight between these guys you know hashtag gamron hashtag armon and i got a response back from somebody basically saying whoa there uh uh you know technical fight yes uh you know whoa on the on the wasn't that great kind of thing and i'm thinking what fucking mma shows are you watching like what are you what are you talking about this was just an amazing fight on all levels just the 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 technical aspect the the crazy scrambles the crazy defense from both guys just every part of it was just so much fun to watch i mean that if that's not a holy fuck fight i don't know what is you have different types of fight fans you got the fans that want the two big slobs throwing <laughs> slow, lazy bombs at each other, right. you know, with no defense and every punch is landing. You know, who didn't like the Don Fry fight, yeah. you know, in Japan? Um, and then you got some people that, you know, pure jiu-jitsu guys that just love the grappling. Right. You know, would rather see that. So, you know, I guess there's some out there that might look at that fight and say it wasn't what they love to see. I think you're out of your mind. But if you watch, <laughs> you know, you follow Twitter, you look at the fighter reactions from those fights – you talk, I mean, I've talked to people in the, that, you know, are high up in the UFC about the fight, during the fight, after the fight, other fighters, coaches, guys at our gym, people are just buzzing. Still buzzing. how good that fight was. I mean, I, I, I stayed up till 5 a.m. Yeah, you're, you're a better man than me. I, I crashed around 3.30 after the post fight. I, I just uh, couldn't, I couldn't get over. Yeah. And I tell you, you know, part of me felt really happy for Gamma. Part of me felt really sad for Armand, even though they both came out strong. Right. You know, I, I just, you know, it's, it's hard not to feel for a guy, you know, not getting a decision in a close fight like that as, as hard as he fought. But I'm just, I was so, I was buzzing so high off of the fight itself. I was literally saying, okay, who do we have out in Vegas for that fight? Because they're three hours behind us. You He'll be awake. Brownie. Let me call Brownie. <laughs> he was he was in Gamrod's corner. Let me call Padumpa. He was in Armand's corner. Who else we got out there? You know, it's just like, fuck. Yeah. The fight was amazing. Yeah, one of the... Best fights I've seen in quite some time, I can remember. Um, and I'm sure there's others I'm just not thinking right now in the morning. It's, but. it's the best technical fight I think I've ever seen. Yes. You know, sometimes you get guys, Dan, that'll just nullify each other. 
you know, they'll clinch, they'll hold, they'll get a takedown, they're squeezing, they're advancing position. But these scrambles meant nobody could hold the other guy down. Nobody was willing, you know, your mindset was, I am not going to concede shit to the other guy and he is not holding me down. And if he does get me down, it's just not going to, we're not staying there. Um, both yeah, guys you're right. You say, you say guys nullify each other, but typically when you see, you know, hey, I'm going to put my will on you. I'm going to impose my will on you. Boom, let's do it. Oh, shit. That's not going to work. This guy's too good at nullifying what I do. I'm not going to exert the energy knowing that I have a high chance of not getting where I want to be. So why, why expend the energy, especially over a five-round fight? Not so much in this fight. These guys had that happen. And so fuck you. I'm just going to keep doing it <laughs> until you break and it works. Yeah. And they were still doing that in the fifth round. It's funny because Armand's corner, you clearly heard him say before the fifth round, you even heard him say early in the fight, hey, no more wrestling. You know, just go in there and try to outstrike, which I thought was good advice. So did I. In the corner. And what's he do? He comes out, throws a shot, and and, and shoots a double. And, and you know, I, it's like, fuck you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get this. And I wonder if that was in his mind to just say, fuck it, I'm gonna prove I'm a better wrestler. I'm gonna get him down. Or it's just a reaction like off of a, what he saw at the time. Just curious on that. But it just, yeah, it just it was, shows it was great corner work by dude. them, right? It was Puddle and John Wood over there in uh, uh, Armand's corner, uh, Mike Brown and a couple of uh, Gamrot's guys from Poland. In, uh, in his corner, uh, bo both corners. Did great advice job. by Brownie when he said, you know what? Forget about that single. It's not working. Do the d Hit the double. Hit your double. Go to the back. You yeah, know, re really shrewd um, in-fight instruction by Mike at that time. Uh, obviously, I didn't know what his, his other coach said. It was in Polish. But uh, just a really good game plan by Brownie to switch it up on the fly and just realize, hey, you're not getting this guy down with a single. His just dexterity and flexibility aren't going to make it happen. It was you, amazing, wasn't it? it tremendous. And to switch it up to the du double and, and go to that and blast and just hit that little duck under and get his back a couple times just really sh shows the, the, the technical aspect and, and the high level of both guys of what they were able to do and, and game, you know, uh, change it up mid-fight. Just tremendous on all levels. I just feel like I'm still gushing over this fight, right? Um, how could you not? Yeah. Yeah, great. You know, you fanboying. 100%. I mean, and, and also watching Gamrod here, Dan – um, everyday grind, um, seeing him come over to the UFC, have his success, finally get to the UFC, and I know that was his dream. Um, and then just watching him grind in here all the time, I'm saying this fucking kid is special, man. He, If he loses, it won't be for a lack of trying, a lack of will, a lack of effort, or any of those at all. Um, he, that kid really gives his heart and soul into it. You know, I, I don't manage a lot of fighters anymore just because I don't like it. It's and you're of, not really good. <laughs> it's, a, it's a thankless <laughs> job. You yeah. know, it's like you're, you spend half your time as a manager arguing with the promoter or the matchmaker, and then you spend the other half your time arguing with the fighter. Right. Because they're never happy with how much they're getting paid. <laughs> they never think they're getting the exact matchup they deserve. Right. Fight with. So it's just kind of a thankless job. I'm like, hey, let's just train guys. Let's get guys ready to fight. Let outside managers, <clears throat> you know, manage the guys. It's great when those managers know if they send their guys to our gym, they're not going to get hijacked by other managers. We're not looking to try to steal anybody's management right. here. Um, but Gamrot's one of the few that I still take care of, and... I'm not sure I've ever what, had... I was going to ask you, what's he like to work with? I don't think I've ever dealt with anybody like him. I'll just give you an example. Hey, Gamera, they're talking about this fight. Whatever you say, boss. But let me go over who, the, who, the, who they're... Th no, I don't care. You give me, give me two weeks. I don't care who I fight. Whoever you think I should fight, fight. That's easy to say, right? You no. know, most fighters say that. But. No, they don't. Not to their right. managers, okay. they don't. All right. Nobody says that. Well, they, they say it out <clears throat> in, the, in, the, in the public sphere. Sure. You know? Who's next for you? Whoever they say. Right. Yeah, bullshit. Right. Nobody was stepping up to fight. Uh, it's, hey, you know, you, you, you got two fights left in your contract. They want to renegotiate it. Oh, cool. Great. Let me know what you get. Let me know what you agree to. Well, no, it's what you agree to. Get. No, no, boss. Whatever you say is fine. I trust you. Amazing. This guy is just un. Believable. Yeah, amazing. And whenever there's someone falls out of a fight, short notice, it's like Dariush and Islam, you know, when, yeah. when when Dariush got hurt. It's like it was like a week. Hey boss, I'm in Poland, I can be there. <laughs> I'm in shape. I train hard. Give me the fight. You know, it's just he will fight anybody. I mean, Dan, it 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 proved it when he called out Armand to begin with. He knew how good Armand is. That's a fight you shy away from. That's a fight like 
fuck, I don't want that. It's not a fight you shy away from when you're fighting to get a title shot and we're both ranked in the top five. But but when you're 11 and he's 12, you're thinking, hey, I know how good this kid is. Let me go grab a, uh, I don't know, whoever's in a, you know, uh, maybe six through 10 and and see the the weak sister there that I could pick off. There's only one reason that fight happened because nobody would fight either one of these guys. It's amazing. And along, and, and on that point, Good luck finding somebody who wants to fight Armand Tazer Saruki and coming off a loss. He's going to be still ranked in, you know, around 11, coming off a loss. Who wants to fight that motherfucker? Yeah, and God forbid it's a three round fight, not five. You've got a fucking. Dude, it's even worse for you if it's a five because that guy's cardio is so fucking good, as he just proved. Um, I mean, nobody's going to want to fight that guy. You got He's a locomotive. You know, he is just a fucking locomotive coming at you. It's, yeah, I just I, I don't have enough praise to heap on on those two dudes. Yeah, and, and there's some fun fights coming up, right? So Fiziev is going to fight uh, RDA, I believe, right? Um, they are. That's that, gonna it's going to show a lot about Fiziev. It will. Um, we'll talk about that fight when it comes up. But yeah, great, I just, good fight. Yeah, just going to kind of <clears throat> shake up the rankings there a little bit. And, but and, look, look and, at those rankings. And, and, and then obviously, you know, you mentioned uh, Islam is probably going to fight in the summertime, right? I'm thinking. Um, He's going to fight Oliveira next. I mean, I know they were they still wanted to do that Dariush fight. Right. But, I mean, the guy deserves a title shot. He's won like how many fights in a row? Was that guy won <clears throat> nine? You know, yeah. he's finishing and guys. So, so it really leaves out there Gagey without a fight. I don't think Chandler has a fight now, and uh, Dariush, right? So yeah, Chandler uh, wants Connor. He wants well, the everybody big money wants fight. Connor. Yeah. I mean, <sighs> you know, Masvidal wants Connor. I mean, if there's a few guys who want to. Want a piece of that, and we'll see what happens with that. But y- you can't hang your hat on that. Wait I, for that. I don't think it's going to be easy to book a fight yeah. for for Gamrot or for Armand's manager to get him a fight. Yeah, right I think now. maybe somebody below those guys might have to fight Armand. It'll be easier right? to find a fight for Gamrot because I imagine he's going to be in the top ten coming off that fight. I mean, is anybody really looking at that thinking that he should be ranked a few spots below Tony Ferguson? I mean, come on. Should he really right. be ranked lower than Conor McGregor? Right. Should he be ranked lower than RDA? I mean, RDA is a fucking stud. He is. He's a former champ. He is a stud. He just wins fights. But, I mean, come on. Who, who, who are you betting on in that fight? Right. You know? But it'll be easier It'll be easier finding a fight for Gamrot <clears throat> coming off a win, being in the top 10. Agreed. Some in the top 10, at least they're going to get some, you know, some, some recognition fighting him. Um, but, I mean, I think he's favored over all those guys right there. I mean... I look at it and I'm thinking, what fights make sense? I know Gamrock called out Gaethje. Um, if I'm managing Gaethje, does that fight make sense for Justin Gaethje? I'm not even sure who Gaethje fights, though. Are you? I'm not sure. I mean, I want to see Gaethje fight anybody just right. because. Because <laughs> it's I Justin mean, Gaethje. Uh, fuck, who doesn't right. want to see him fight anybody? You know, anybody? maybe the fight to make is let Gaethje go up to 70 and him and DP bang it out again. Or have him banging out again at 55. Um, I don't know. That, that fight would be great. I mean, right. everybody loved that fight. It was a fight of the year contender. I mean, maybe that's um, the fight to make. But I, th- uh, I think that'd be a great fight hey, you know to what? watch. I'm glad I'm not a matchmaker right now. That's uh, Sean's job to deal I, with. I'd like I'd like to see. I think the fight that makes the most sense is is Gamrod and Benio. Yeah, that's a great fight. Uh, I love watching Benio fight. I'm a fan of his. Stud. And, and, to, and to watch him and his skill set go against what we just saw with Gamrod. And, and just, to my point saying that people don't want to fight certain people – I would be stunned if Benil Darius ever turned down a fight. Oh, I'm with you on that. Any, that guy will fight anybody. Yeah, I mean, and, his, and I don't say that about very many people. Right. He will fight anybody. And, and his biggest handicap is just some of the injuries that he's incurred and all that. But, I mean, tremendous talent, tremendous fighter, uh, fun fighter to watch. And, and if him and Gamrot get it on, man. I don't know if the timing works out because – Darius may be ready to fight now coming off his injury where right. Cameron might need a little bit of time to relax and recover and spend a little time with his kid back home before he fights again towards the end of the year. Yeah, so maybe Gamera, uh, maybe But I'd love to see that fight. Yeah, maybe Darius fights pretty soon in the summer and then they're able to run it in the in, in the further in the year. If I had know? my druthers, I'd like to see Gamera fight Benil and, and the winner fight the winner of, of uh, Islam, Islam and, and yeah. Oliveira. Makes and sense it just me. makes the most sense in the world to me. You know, I'm not a matchmaker, but that's what would make the most sense to me. But, yeah. man... Just, yeah, like you said, good luck, getting, away by those two good, good luck getting arm on a fight. But there were some other <sighs> – believe it or not, there were other fights on this card. <laughs> so uh, Yes, there were. Yeah, I don't know where you want to – let's start from let's the, talk. Let's, let's talk about Tiago Moises' one arm. Jesus. Rear naked choke. Yeah. How fucking beautiful was that? Man, just – you know, it's so difficult to finish guys <clears throat> when, they, when you get their backs. It's not an easy thing. You know, a lot of guys just say, you know, two-on-one grip on the arm. You just keep fighting the hands. How much time is left? I don't um, know if people who <clears throat> have and, never done it 
know how difficult it becomes wearing those gloves. I was just going to say, and one important aspect is it's so much different <clears throat> from a sport aspect of grappling, whether you're with the gi, without the gi. Obviously, with gi, you've got some sleeves you can use and lapels. Uh, and then with no gi, submission grappling, you know, you're able to pummel in there a little bit easier with your knuckles or fingers. There's ways to do it. 100%. Now, now you get guys with gloves and you just make the grip on the glove and you can't pull out. You actually saw that in Sabatello's fight at one point. You know, couldn't even move. He was like stuck in there. And just go to down. your own experience when, when you know, you were a younger man and used to train a lot. I would say, and, and when, when our team went from being primarily jujitsu based to MMA based, yeah. and we're still training every day, whenever you'd see, you know, all the fighters, they're training with gloves on, as you should. Right. You know, you want to train with gloves on because you're fighting with gloves on. You know, personally, I don't think you train with a gi when you're not fighting with a gi. Even though there are some benefits to it, but, you know, there's some benefits to getting on a treadmill, you know, but there's certain things you can do better than that, maybe for right. particular Preparation. fighting. Um, but when you'd see a guy on the mat just getting ready to roll jiu-jitsu wearing gloves, you're like, oh, fuck, yeah. Right. He's wearing gloves. I'm not. Just give me his wrist. How's he going to How's he gonna break my grip? Yeah, how's man. he going to choke me when I'm going like this? <clears throat> he's got to get that big old glove in there. So, yes, it's very difficult, as you were saying, to choke somebody wearing <laughs> those gloves. And... And when you're on somebody's back and they're standing up, man, it's a lot. It's a lot of pressure for you to keep your, you know, your uh, body lock on. You know, when you switch to that and you're holding it, the guy's pulling your hand. There's a lot of weight on you too. You know, you're you're you're, you're still trying to dig in there. Then you get one arm across. You're like, okay, now you still got to fight and close it up. And whether you're going switch into a gable grip or you're going behind. Um, I don't know how many people know the backstory behind <laughs> Tiago Moises so learning you, that choke. So, so the so the choke, you know, he he obviously finished the choke with one arm. But I'm going to let you give the backstory on on how this came about. Cool. So Grant Dawson's been down for one camp. Um, moved down. His wife also fights. She moved down. They're training full time here, and just I mean, he immersed himself into this gym. Yeah. And he's just such a good dude with such a great attitude. But him and Tiago Moises really took a liking to each other. They became training partners. And like literally very quickly, they became very tight to the point where Tiago Moises was in Grant's corner right. for his last fight. And Grant was in Tiago's corner for this fight. Well, I mean, Tiago's a black belt in jiu-jitsu, a very accomplished jiu-jitsu guy. That's where he comes from. But you can always learn shit. And if, you've been, if you've been training long enough, you, you, sometimes you come up with your own things. Well, Grant came up with his choke. And it's where you're on the back, and they're you know you know they're already ready for for the other arm to come in to go for the choke. So you're not going to get it in there. So if you watch what Tiago did, he's here, he's on his shoulder, getting a little bit of a grip. He knows he's not going to be able to lock his arms. So what he does is he goes around, grabs his elbow, crunches down with his clamps down, right, to pinches in pressure. Bows down a little bit to create all that pressure. You saw how quickly he tapped yes. when he did it. Grant calls it the pouting five-year-old. Because picture <laughs> your five-year-old kid not getting his way, crossing his arms and just lowering his head. That's and getting, great. And getting upset. And I actually had a guy years ago tweak my guillotine for me, and it was similar. He's like, get your head above the guy, close your shoulders, elbows in, and just squeeze down. And it took my guillotine from being, like, decent to being, like, great. <clears throat> And and it's just it create you saw the pressure. I mean that guy tapped quick yeah. when when he did that. And it's just so cool. It's just guys exchanging knowledge and you know one of the benefits of having our gym where so many people come to our team and come through here, even people that may not stick around for a long time. It's not just them coming here to learn things from our fighters and our coaches. It's us learning things from them as well. <clears throat> Two, two things about that. Number one, I'm super impressed that you're able to touch your shoulders without throwing one out. That's very impressive. I've got no labrums in either one, so it, it but, was a little bit but of But getting back to your point task. about the exchange of information, I've, I've seen, um, you know, Mike Brown does a couple technical classes at night, and, like, somebody new will come through, Honey Yaya, when he first came by. First thing Brown says, hey, Honey, you know, we've competed against each other, whatever. Why don't you show this choke? You're really good at it. I don't want to teach tonight. You bring what you have to the table, and you show it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I will. Boom, he shows something. Padumpa, hey, this guy's in there. This black belt, Felipe Costa, had stopped by one time. You know, hey, this guy's phenomenal. You know, you've beaten Gordon Ryan, whatever. Felipe, you mind show up? Yeah, absolutely. Let me show you what I do from this position. So that transfer of information to that, that you were talking about is just amazing. And it's not just, hey, show us something that you do well. It's if you come to our group classes and it's Mako Monday and it's wrestling. Here's Padumpa, our grappling coach, who's not the wrestling coach, obviously. He's right there on the bleachers or he's on the mat 
not to teach, to watch, right. to say, let me see what they're doing and let me see these guys using it to see what I can learn from it. From my Friday my class. Or what, or what I can take and add something that I do. You see Steve Mako doing Bruno's kickboxing class. Yep. Trying to just learn and feel and, and coaches absorb. But it's not just him watching what Mako's teaching people. It's Mike Brown watching all these guys train to see what they're doing to say, whoa, whoa, what the fuck was that? Right. Show me that because I think that would work for this guy or that guy. It's not just here's Mike Brown's style. You right. Know, take them down, wrist ride, do this. It's, hey, I'm an MMA coach. I want to, I want to help my guys with their game, what would be best for their game and their style. And if he sees Yaroslav, I remember he saw Yaroslav do something that just blew him away. And he's like, I remember that would work for this guy, this guy, and this guy. And just right away, he's grabbing those guys in their next class. And he's like, hey, let me show you what Yaroslav does. Hey, Yaroslav, come show them what you're doing on your entry because it'll work for their games right. might not work for everybody but it's just it's just such you know, a it's funny you talk about that and then you get a guy like bo nickel who showed a couple stuff to some of the guys and uh i remember charlie decker threw his shoulder out okay bo that, that might just work for you and nobody else but also yeah, artem a freak you see artem levin who's just a pure kickboxer striking legend um and he was in Mako's class learning how to wrestle. And I said, God, you suck off your back, Artem. You know, he's <laughs> laughing. But, I mean, it just shows you the, the, the evolution. You, you said it, Tiago's a black belt in jiu-jitsu. If you haven't seen Tiago, he had this beautiful helicopter sweep to armbar and LFA that yep. kind of went viral. That and was here, the sub of the year that year. I yeah, think. I mean, went viral, phenomenal, um, really good jiu-jitsu, tight game. And here you picked up this little thing from Grant Dawson who just came to our team, and you were able to utilize that in your win. Just tremendous win. Um, for Tiago getting back on the uh, the win column there, great look great. Um, Umar was right in front of me. Nurmagomedov um, did what he does best. He just took the guy down, dominated. He, look, he looked pretty dominant. He did. Uh, Chris Curtis <clears throat> um, with Rodolfo, man, body shots. Did I love that left. Yes, I did. Body? I, I love to see a guy do that. Uh, well placed body shots. I mean, Rodolfo's tough dude, man. He oh, he ate some as- shit. Yeah. You know, I mean, just, he had his little brain surgery. Just to come back from that, you've got a pair of balls. Um, there's other things you can do in life that, that are a little bit easier on your body. I, your I, thought, I thought Curtis put on a clinic of how to work the body he looked in good. a fight. Yeah. I compare that to, uh, you know, the night before I was at the Bellator show at Mohegan Sun, and we had Killies. Oh, God. A fight. Killies, modern. And, and it was a war. I mean, these guys were just people that got a little bit bored during the, the game rot. An Armand <laughs> fight, they would have loved the Achilles fight from Bellator the night before because those guys were swinging for the slobber knock fences. But at one point, at the end of the first round, sometimes guys like when they hear the, you know, the ten seconds left, they try to end it on a big flurry to make right. a statement, try to like yep. maybe a close round edge it out to them, or maybe they're just like, "Fuck, I only got ten seconds. I'm gonna see if I can land something here at the end." He started throwing bombs to the to the midsection, and I'm just thinking, dude, you're standing right in the pocket. Right in front of the guy, Hands and you're down. throwing multiple shots, and this guy's slinging for your head, and I've got I'm having Aaron Pico flashbacks. Right. You know, it's like, yes. dude, hit the body is you know a lost art on a lot of MMA guys because you know small gloves, you're in close, it's dangerous as fuck. But man, if you're gonna hit the body, hit it, and either follow up with a shot to the head or get the fuck Clinch, out. Clinch, take down off that. You know, right. But man, <laughs> Curtis put on a clinic, and how tough was Rodolfo to eat all those? Agreed, agreed, and, and we skipped over the. Uh, I think it was the, was it the co-main um, with oh, uh, Magni and uh, Rachmanov. Shavkat's uh, a uh, – He's a problem, man. He's that, a problem. Yeah, he, he looked really good. Uh, another fighter out of Kazakhstan who, who, who just shined on this card. Magni stepped up, took the fight. You talk about guys that actually will fucking fight anybody. Ma- Magni seems to raise his hand every time somebody's looking for a fight. So, you know, shout out to him for having actually a big sack and taking on this kid who – Hey, probably a little bit beneath you in the rankings, and now shot himself up into the rankings there. And now Dominant people, win. And now people are talking about <clears throat> him versus um, Chimayov, Chimayov. Right? Shavkat? And yeah, well, they, they, yeah they, they mentioned those names about, but... Uh, I'd be surprised if they did that fight. Me, me too. You know, it's... Again, but, now, now, but, but they did Armand and Gamera. Right, so they, you know, anything's possible. Every, everything's on the table. You, you, you're you're going to talk about two guys that are going to have trouble getting fights. You know, I would think those guys might be a possible matchup. Um, just fun fights to watch there in in in, uh, in the welterweight division. We had two other guys on the card. Just want to mention real briefly. We had uh, Sergey uh, fighting on that card, and uh, he he talked about a slobber knocker in the beginning. He was getting uh, and he got hurt early. Yeah, he was getting bombed up a little bit in that first round, and, and but was able to come out. His takedowns were on point. He was able to change the the direction of that fight. 
based on his grappling and, and, and wrestling work and pulled out the decision, happy for him. And then Cody Durden um, comes back with a with a, a stamp on a first-round TKO win, and it felt like all his frustrations built up. You know, he was able to put out. He had lost to Muhammad Makayev before that, who's down here now. They train together, and I know Cody was disappointed from that. But uh, Did you hear what he said when he walked over to the table where – I think Hunter and Sean. I were belong there. here, or something was something. I like belong that. here. Yeah, you know, I think it was. I, I fucking belong. Yeah, I thought here. it was a couple. Was like, yeah. Damn right, I do. Yeah, good for him, man. Really good Solid. kid, hardworking kids out of uh, ATT Atlanta. Works a lot with the Lima brothers, um, and he did his camp here. So I'm happy for him. We went four and zero on the night main event to win like that is, is pretty. Uh, uh, one one other fight to me- to mention is uh, that Mario Batisti fought Brian Kelleher, and oh. Kelleher's tough as shit. And he smoked him. <coughs> yeah, you know, he finished him quick. Yeah, and I'll there were some other good fights on there too. But you're right about that Mario Batista kid. Um, looked looked impressive in his win. And then um, I think the heavyweights, if you like the slobber knocker, that was pretty good. That was a fun fight to watch. And uh, that was good a show. Pretty, yeah, it was a great, great card. And whenever whenever a show ends on a fight like that, it's just everybody leaves just high. Agreed. You know, it's just just crazy. Um, and it's not because weed's legal in. <laughs> over there but yeah no it's a tremendous card uh there was another great one on bellator i don't know how many people got to see that there was also a pfl the same night a lot of stuff going on um but we had a pretty big night toot toot on the horn there for us uh, we went five and one we had johnny fighting for the title we had danny sabatello in the bantamweight tournament we had Killy's mata who you'd mentioned we got a kid flying under the radar named shabli alexander shabli we had a saba Who's never in a boring fight, and then we had um, Cody Law, and we'll start it from the beginning, then from the from the bottom up, we'll run it. So to start off our weekend, we had what six, seven, we had eleven fighters that weekend, and Cody was our first guy, Cody Law, and unfortunately he he took a loss, uh, lost a decision um, on our first fight. I'm like, oh, that's not really the way to start the weekend for our guys. First L for Cody. Yeah, tough so he matchup. Was, the kid was 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 good. solid, technical, yep. tough kid. And you know sometimes you need to taste that that loss, you know, early in a career. Everybody loses. Just to uh, everybody does, um, and uh, we'll see how he responds to it. He's a, he's just such a solid hard worker, and he's very talented. I think he'll learn from it and bounce back strong. I, I have no doubt. He's also a very intelligent guy. I think he'll be able to talk to the coaches, regroup, see what he needs to work on, and he'll actually put that in his his. Uh, <clears throat> Plans for the future to get better. So, absolutely, um, still high on Cody. Uh, Saba was the next guy up, I believe. And um, I don't know. Does Saba have like a, a a different gear other than on off? I mean, that's it, man. He 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 was pissed from the press conference. You know, guy got in his face, did a little headbutt to Saba. Saba shoved him off. They kind of went at it. They kind of went at it. Well, first of all, Saba's a dick. <laughs> but you know, no, but Saba's our dick. Oh, he is clearly our dick, and I love him. Yeah, great but, kid. I mean, he he gets into trouble. Every show, he gets into arguments. That wasn't his fault. Every show. Dude, he cussed out a commissioner on his way out and almost got kicked out of the building after the fight. And he won. You know, he's just – he's just – two speeds. Yeah. Sleeping and to the 10th degree. Yeah, on off. Super yeah. – great training partner, great teammate. And, man, fun that kid. guy comes to fight. Yeah, fun He's kid. either finishing you or he's getting finished. Don't, don't plan on being around in the third round of that fight. Right. I mean, he's uh, been in plenty of wars, plenty of gym wars. Uh, you know, he's got the pedigree, the chops, the whole nine, and now he's got the bl- bleach blonde hair, and he is on fire lately. But hell of a knockout for Saba. I mean, he just yeah. dropped some dynamite bombs. And- Saba's a very dangerous fighter. He, he is. He's, he's got a lot of power and a lot of ability to finish fights. And a good wrestler, too. He just doesn't use it. He just rather stand and throw. He, he just needs to... Harness you know, it a get little bit. Get a little bit of a regulator in there because yeah. fights don't always end in the first round. <clears throat> but you know you what, know? Dan? It's funny. Sometimes you, you you try to change a guy's style a little bit, and it ruins it for him. I think Saba just is like, fuck it, man. I'm going in there, throwing down. This is what I do. And you know what? A guy like Saba, he's the kind of guy that could have a 10-year career at Bellator. Even if you lose some fights, they're all fun. Yeah, great. Everybody's going – nobody's sitting down at the end of one right. of Saba's fights. And I think that's you know, why Paul Daly seats, lasted so are... long as well. He's always a yeah. fun fight to watch, Paul Daly, right? So Yes, always. Yeah. Next guy up from there is, is a guy I'm really high on, and that's uh, my boy Alexander Shabli um, from Russia. Shout out to his coach. His, uh, his name is Shut Up. <laughs> um, great guy here in the gym, great training partner. Um, shame on you for not putting this picture up yet. I got to get on that and take care of this. So uh, now it's my job. So Jordan, if you're listening, I need some pictures. Um, yeah, Chablis looked great, man. And, Against and, the guy 
uh, Brent Primus, and I'll let you talk about that one. You, you, you judge wins not just by how a guy looks, but who he did it against. Yeah. You know, sometimes people go, well, how did that guy not get a bonus? And the UFC said, did you see that finish? It's like, yeah, but look who he finished it against. He finished it against a guy who got a fight on short notice. He's 0-3 in the UFC. He's never beaten anybody very good. He should have gotten a finish like that. But this other guy had a finish that may have been less spectacular, but he did it against a stud. You know, I'm giving the bonus to the guy that did it against the guy who's the stud. Right. Brett Primus is a stud. That guy is very good, former Bellator champion. You know, some people, you know, didn't give him the credit I thought he deserved for beating Chandler because Chandler got that dead foot yep. in the fight. But, Off a kick. But, yeah, it's not like he did it because he stepped wrong. He right. did it because he, he took a hard kick, and it it just affects that nerve. Right. It's weird. You get that drop foot type thing from it, but he won. And then he had a rematch with Chandler, which was a war. You know, went, went five rounds. Chandler was beating him up quick. He then came back, dropped Chandler like in the fourth round. Brett Primus is a stud, never been finished in his life. And, man, Alexander finished him in the second round and did it definitively. So that is a – that's a statement win for him. Man, I was texting you during that fight, and I just says, I think Alexander got the timing down now um, as they entered towards that – towards the latter part of that first round. The second round, you could just see it. He was so comfortable on his feet. His striking was just – I mean, sniper-like. I was um, – I was on the fence who was going to win that fight. I did not – have a feeling one way or the other. I thought it was a pick em fight. I know Shibli was a pretty good favorite. He was like minus 170 or something like that, which I'm not sure anybody should be minus 170 in Bellator against Brett Primus. Brett Primus is fucking good. Um, and at the end of the first round, I'm thinking, I think Shabley's going to finish him just yeah. because he was he was hurting him in that first round. And he's, he's you watch him training with high-level guys. We got a lot of high-level guys around 55 because they train with 75ers. Yep. I mean, so with 70ers, they go down, they fight with some some 45ers that are big. And it's like I've seen him against a lot of good guys in this gym, and he is just so well-rounded. <clears throat> and, uh, man, he let it go in that fight, and he came out looking good. Yeah. Um, definitely impressed by Chablis and, and watching him here in the gym and putting it together. Yeah, he's a stud. Like keep, your eye, keep your eye on him. I would be surprised if he did not end up with some, some hardware. Some hardware, honestly. Yeah. Like. Um, Killies Mata, um, and I guess he lived up to his name, Killies. He just went out there throwing bombs. Um, that was the style. That was, that was the fight of the night. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he just went at it and uh, against Stan Moreau. And um, tremendous fight by both guys. Both guys just said, fuck it, let's throw down. <laughs> And it just had a three-round war, and Achilles came out with a W on that. So, um, shout out to Achilles. How, how about you want to talk about a fight that impressed you, Magomedov and Enrique Barzola? Yeah, Enrique used to train here. Super tough guy. We had a, a program here. We were trying to develop some Latin American guys along with the UFC, and we had a break in. And we, actually, he was one of the guys here. We actually recommended Enrique at the time. I think Sean was looking for fifty-fivers only. And I think Sean had asked me, hey, you know, I'd give him a weekly update. I right. think it was a every bi-weekly update. And I, I always shoot straight with Sean. And he's like, I said, man, I don't really have any of the 55ers really that I think are qualified for, for you, Sean, at the UFC, to be honest. Yeah, they said, had sent us some guys, right? Right, yeah. They, they sent it. We, we put the house up, right? And we were developing them. And it was guys from, you know, Central and South America, uh, guys that the UFC identified and sent our way to try to develop them. And Enrique was one of them. And I said, but hey, Sean, there's a guy at 45, probably beat all these 55ers ass. You might want to take a look at him. And Enrique Barzola said, oh, fuck yeah, I'll take a look at him. And Sean's credit, he signed him. And uh, he stayed here for a couple fights. And Enrique left to go to AKA. Um, so that was a weird one. But anyway, uh, he fought Magomed. I know how tough and, uh, Barzola is, but boy, did Magomed Magomedov take his game to the next level during this fight? You know, he's obviously got a big pedigree. He had the win over Peter Yan. Um, early in the career yep. um, that some people you know, thought was a bad decision. I never went back and watched the fight, so I don't know. But <clears throat> I knew that Barzola just puts a pace on people. You know, he, and he's strong, Dan. Oh, yeah. And, and his wrestling is good. I mean, you saw him come out and take Caldwell down. Tough kid. And beat him up in their last fight. The kid is tough. He's strong. But he can go forever. Yep. His cardio is as good as you're anybody's. Not, you're not breaking him. And he's going to try to break you. Yep. And Magomedov's loss in Bellator – was to Stotts, right? Yes. And that was in a really close fight. I think it was a split decision. Um, but uh, uh, I was in a unanimous decision yep. right there. Um, but it was a really good fight. But in that fight, I remember Magomedov getting tired, you know, in, in, the, in that third round. 
And I'm thinking, man, if, if that guy's gas isn't up to par, this is a five-round five fight because it's part of the tournament. Enrique is going to be there in rounds four and five, and he is going to put it on him if yep. he starts to fade. And early in the fight, they were both having success. And I, what really, really struck me was, A, Mag Magomedov's cardio. That guy was not breathing hard on a high, high-paced fight that went into the fourth round. That guy wasn't tired at all. Yeah. And Enrique is a tough guy not to get tired against. And his striking was so crisp. You know, I think, you know, you watch a Mag Magomedov and you think, well, he's, he's grappling-based. You know, he's going to want to take his guy down. He's got a great wrestling game. He's got a good top game. You know, Enrique's as close to impossible to hold down as a guy can be. I mean, he just, the second his ass hits that yep. mount, it's like it's got a spring on it. He's just up to his feet. And I think Magomedov realized quick on, hey, man, I can't hold this guy down. You know, at least not now, early in the fight. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to resort to my striking. Man, his striking was crisp. It was good, and so was Enrique's, and it was a war. Yeah. And it was very closely contested. I'd like to see what the judges' scorecards were after three. But then he hit that guillotine on in, in round four and, and, and finished it up. But so, Magomedov, I, I, I think he's a top five guy in the world in his weight class. Yeah, so two things. Enrique's I don't think has ever been finished before. Um, and that's the first time he's been finished in a fight. So that's pretty impressive on a guillotine. And the second thing is, Dan, like you said, hey, Magomed went away from the takedowns realizing I can't take Barzola down. That's just great fight IQ. <laughs> yes, it on, is. On, on a veteran fighter to realize that and make the adjustments. So that's one part of the bracket. Magomed moves on, um, <clears throat> and, and he'll go fight uh, Patchy Mix yes. in, in the next round. But we had one of our guys. In the other side, Kirsten Kurt, right? Saylor, Italian stallion over there, the Italian in the, gangster, Danny it's the Sabatella. other half of the bracket, right? It's the, the other it's the side, semifinals. Yep. Or is it the quarterfinals? Uh, it's the quarterfinals. Quarter is going into the semis. So this is going into the semis, right? So so Sabatello fought Leandro Higo and was taunting him all week, and <clears throat> you know um, that's one of those fights that if you're not a fight fan, you're probably like, uh, hey, I want to watch a rock'em sock'em fight. Danny is going to take you down, grind you out, and he basically did that for four rounds. Second round, he got in a little trouble. Higo got his back. Credit to Danny. Didn't panic. Defended and the Higo's back. good. And Higo finishes guys, right? And we talked about that early on, um, that it's really tough to finish guys, but Higo stayed on his back, I think, for four minutes of this round. I'm like, oh, shit, Higo can finish. And Danny just stayed composed, got out of there, and it's like he got up after that second round, and some guys are a little dejected and tired, and, man, he's looking around, kind of bopping around, like, okay, whatever, third round, I'll take him down again and do what I do, and Danny just went right back to the game plan of sticking to the game plan, grinded Higo out, um, nice win for Danny, and he'll go on now and fight Stotts, um, which should be a barn burner of a fight. Man, you know, it's... It's the, there were some boos in that fight. There were a lot of boos in that fight. If you if you if you if you watch the fight, um, even Higo was Higo was the baby face. Everybody wanted to win because right. Danny, you know, the Italian gangster gimmick. He's walking around all week with a Higo sucks birds sweatshirt. up to the, everybody. I F mean, you to the crowd. Trying to find up. a picture of Danny to put up in the gym where he's not giving the middle finger in the picture, but I can't <laughs> find one, so I'm just going to go with it. <laughs> you, you said to me, "Hey, go put this pic, go find this picture of Danny. And he's shooting a bird, right?" And I said. Okay, I said, unless he's got one with two, it would look better. You know, and he did. He does, you yeah, found one. <laughs> so, you know, there were boos in that fight because, you know, at times Danny's just going to grind you. He's getting better at doing damage. He's picking up on his elbow game from inside the guard. <clears throat> yep. He threw some nice calf kicks in that fight. But I couldn't tell, and I wasn't sure if people were booing because, A, they thought was going to be a, was getting boring, or B, just because they hate Danny so much, and when he gets in a controlling position, they're so pissed off because they want to see him get his ass kicked. So I thought it was a combination of the two. They even booed Ego when he was on the back because they wanted him to do damage and right. hurt Danny instead of looking for the choke. But when the fight was over and Danny won a unanimous decision, 49-46 across, and they brought Stotts in for the face-off for the next fight, Stotts was the most popular person in that state. He said, you suck. That fight sucked, and the people went oh, they, nuts. They did. They want to see Stotts kill Danny. He went uh, baby face. Is that what you call it, Dan? Stotts became the biggest <laughs> baby face in the world. Danny's the heel. And let me tell you something. Promoting a fight, two emotions matter. That, that sells. Love, right? Love and, and hate. hate. Yeah. Those are the only two emotions that mean anything in promoting a fight. And... Dude, there is a lot of love right now for Stotts, and there's a lot of hate for Danny, and that's going to be an interesting fight because Stotts is an uber athlete, yep. great wrestling pedigree. He knocks people out now. He won his last fight by KO. Dan, it's the, the big thing is 
Danny's fighting for an interim belt his next fight, right? Yes, he that's, is. that's the big thing to take away that Danny goes into the semifinal and he's going to fight a guy in Stotts who's the interim <clears throat> champ, and Danny, Danny could have a belt after that fight. So it's just a huge fight, not only for the one step away for the finals, right? But just where he's at. Everybody right? talks that 135 may be the UFC's toughest, deepest division because there's such studs in there. Dude, Bellator's 135 pound division is great as well. I asked you. You know, hey, where would you put Magomed, um, Magomedov? Mag Mag Magomedov. Uh, I've got the other two Magomeds in my mind that are fighting in PFL this week. Where would you put uh, Magomed Magomedov? Where would you rank him in the UFC's ranking um, from from Bellator? Just to, if he was signed the next day to go to UFC in in the one thirty five pound weight class, and what did you say? I have him top five in the world. And the guy is, and, and there's some. And I did not go into that fight because I questioned his cardio, right? And I wasn't. As blown away with his striking as I became after the fight. And that's Dude, a pretty that good guy. division between Moreno and uh, Kai Kai. No, no, 35. <clears throat> Pirion, TJ Dillashaw. I'm sorry. Aldo yeah. Sanhagen. Right, I'm, I'm looking for Cheeto Vera. Right. I mean, Rob Font. There's some San, good Sanhagen's guys. Sanhagen's great. Right. Yeah, so uh, absolutely. So, um, I mean, I'm, I'm looking right now at the UFC's top five in that division. Peter, um, I've got your champion there. But then you've got Jan Dillashaw, Aldo Sanhagen, I, one, know, two, three, four. I put him right there you know, after funny, number you, four. You say, can he beat Sterling? Could. Can he beat Yan? He did before. I'm not sure he would do it again. I know Peter Yan came back and beat him. I don't I'm not he, betting against Peter Yan against I would never. I, I think Peter Yan would beat him. TJ Gillespie would be a really interesting fight. Uh, Jose Aldo's striking and takedown fence are pretty good, um, even at this advanced stage. Cody Sanhagen's a fucking nightmare matchup. Right, Marlon Vera, another tough guy. Devashili Devish is, is really tough. Uh, just a, a little bit of a buzzsaw himself. Um, maybe, maybe the edge on striking. But I look, I look at those numbers. Yeah, I put them underneath Jan Dillashaw, Aldo, and Sanhagen. I put them above Vera. I put them above me, Rob, Rob Font, Dominic Cruz. I put him number five on that list right there. That guy is really good. He's got a tough fight with Patchy Mix. I think he wins that fight. Yeah, and then I think he fights the winner of Danny and Stotts. And pff, dude, those are good guys. Yeah, the winner of that tournament is coming out of that fucking washing machine in the dryer. With and, a million bucks? And, and a little disheveled, a little beat up, and thinking, fuck, man, I'm a really one of the top uh, 135ers yes. in the world. Absolutely. Yeah, 100%. Uh, we spent a shit ton of time on, on a lot of stuff. We didn't even touch on Johnny versus Giergard Mursasi for, for this middleweight title. Giergard, a legend. Uh, we've talked about how much of a fan I am. I know you are, too, of Giergard, his style, his his fighting pedigree, how good he is and all that. And But we also know how great Johnny was here in the gym, his improvements, how he's getting better, his self-belief, and going into this fight. And it was like, man, can't wait to see this one happen. And Johnny just fucking shined, man. Like I, I not, love – Didn't win the fight. Johnny dominated a legend. And I think that needs to sit in, soak in. And I know there's still that buzz of everyone talking about the UFC, but, man – if you didn't see this fight, go watch Johnny Evelyn. Go rewatch this fight against Giergard Masasi, and you're going to come away saying, holy shit, this kid is fucking legit and one of the best middleweights in the world right now. I try to talk to Mike Brown every day. I always want to pick his brain because he spends so much time in the gym. He spends so much time breaking down his guys, everybody else when he's home. He lives for MMA. It's the biggest MMA dork you're ever going to meet in your life. He lives for it. And I always try to pick his brain on the guys he works with you know, because you know, I'm at the gym here every day as well. Other than AEW Wednesdays, <laughs> I was gonna <laughs> say. <laughs> um, and I'm watching guys, and I think I have a pretty good grip on talent and watching guys train and what I'm seeing. But you know, Mike Brown's Mike Brown, and he obviously has a much better understanding of his guys than I'm ever gonna have. So I always try to ask him about his guys and who's doing well and who's not, and who you know, how do you feel about this? And for the last year plus, he has just been so high on Johnny. And he's been, dude, he's getting so good. His footwork is so natural, and his striking's this, and his head's always offline. It's unconventional. He's starting to work in some front kicks, which is really going to open up some shit. His fucking wrestling, his scrambling, da 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 You know, what always stood out to me was Johnny's scrambling. And, you know, it's it's like scrambling is wrestling, but it's also... It's an art. And MMA wrestling is <clears throat> scrambling, you know? And I never see Johnny lose a scramble. And I used to, I used to say that about Colby. You know, people, oh, how's Colby? The guy just doesn't lose scrambles. And when you end up on top every time something happens, you win you're, rounds. You're, in a, you're in a good position. And Johnny's scrambling is excellent. But then Mike starts telling me about other parts of his game, so I start watching it. And, you know, over the last year, i become so sold on Johnny and how good he is and how much better he is 
than he was a month ago and a month before that. That guy is just and and the mental side of the game, fighter IQ, you know, but his fighter, his fight IQ is not limited to the cage. This guy takes it to everything he does. He's just very professional. He's not going out there and doing stupid shit. He's I've never worried about what Johnny Evelyn's going to do on a weekend. He, he did buy a motorcycle. You know? I say, hey, Johnny, can you leave that in the garage until the after the fight? In fact, I think he's going to sell his motorcycle. But you're 100% right. And, and what impressed me, you know, we had Sean Strickland down for, for a week here. And sometimes when you get a different guy coming into the gym and he came down to help Johnny, obviously, and obviously get some work with Artem because he's because of his fight coming up this week. Sean might be one fight away from a title shot. Yeah, and that's a top middleweight there. And I was watching them spar. And so when you think about Sean Strickland, what you know, his strength is stand up striking and not giving a fuck and coming forward and keep throwing and pretty elusive at times too. And I watched them spar. And it's not to say one was better than the other, but man, I saw how confident Johnny was sparring Sean Strickland. I said, Fucking Sean is good, man. You know, and I'm watching his sparring. I'm like. That's got to build a tremendous confidence for Johnny springboarding into this fight with Musasi. And you saw it. Johnny was fucking loose as a goose, man. He was intense. I mean, I'd be shitting my pants when he regarding Musasi. So as, as, as high as I am on Johnny and was going into this fight, you always got to look at who they're fighting. And yeah. Gegard Musasi, dude, the guy is a – everybody throws the legend word yeah. around. This guy is a fucking legend with a capital L. He is a fucking stud. Go to his list of people he's beaten. He is a fucking stud. I Go do, to the list of the guys he's fought. I do think he gets a little disinterested at times. And I've seen fights with him like when he fought Jacare where it just didn't seem like he – almost seemed like he didn't care as much. But the guy's been on a roll in Bellator. <clears throat> Motivated. He's so skilled. He's so well-rounded. If he gets on top of you, he's a fucking killer. Standing up, he's a fucking killer. You know, the guy is just – his hips are great. His takedowns are good. So I'm thinking going to this fight – Johnny's never fought anybody at this level. You know, the toughest fight Johnny had come into this was John Salter. Right. Who's just, in my opinion, more tough than he is skilled. And Salter's great. Salter's a great record, been around a long time. But he gets by so much on being more tough than he does skilled. So I'm thinking, Johnny's never fought anybody near as skilled as Gegard. So going into it, I know how good Johnny is. I've seen how good Gegard is against the highest of the highest level. I'm thinking there's two outcomes that this fight. Either Gegard's going to hurt Johnny and... You know, show Johnny you're not quite at this level yet and beat him up, or Johnny's gonna fucking dominate this guy every second of every minute of every round. Dan, when you said dominate Gearguard, were you thinking more on the grappling, wrestling aspect of it? Well, I mean, he hit seven or eight takedowns, so he did that. Did I expect him to drop him <laughs> to come out there and, and show how quick his hands were? Yeah. You know, it's one thing to have quick hands when you're hitting mit mitts, and they're always where they're supposed to be when you're right. throwing it. It's another thing to do it against a guy like Musasi, who's so dangerous and such a good counter striker and so accomplished. I mean, Johnny dominated everything about that fight. Yeah. I was blown away at how, and you talk about how composed he was. I mean, dude, that guy was completely unfazed. I mean, at one point in the fight, he hit Gegard and gave him that little point. It's like, dude, now you know. That, that to me is scary because. You know, you, you, you don't want to wake up the sleeping giant or the arousal guy. I mean, Johnny was on cruise control. It didn't fucking matter. I mean, he was just, like you said, pointed him out during the fight, uh, doing a little celebration dance after the first or second round. I forgot what it was. Did his little celebration dance after the fight as well. In the fourth round, if um, I could encapsulate that fight with one little clip, in the fourth round, Johnny blasted just a really good right hand. Hurt Musasi. Musasi backed up. Johnny closed in, went for a flying knee which was from too far away, landed and just blasted a double yeah. and just planted him. Yeah. And it was like, holy fuck. Best I've ever seen Johnny look, firing on all cylinders, and I don't even think Johnny hit his peak yet. How, how old is Johnny? Is he 30? Okay. I, I, I don't even think he's hit his peak yet. I don't think he's hit his peak as far as his, his total potential and athletic ability. If, I, if, I don't think he's hit it yet. If you have watched his improvement over the last 12 months, you, you would have to agree with that statement because he is – the Johnny right now would absolutely destroy oh, Johnny from a year ago. It wouldn't even – I mean, it would be brutal. Yeah, it would be it wouldn't bad. Even, it, it wouldn't even be in the same – yeah, you, you, you think there's two different fighters there and, and, and there is. And the Johnny a year from now might not destroy the Johnny right now because I'm not sure anybody's destroying the Johnny right now. Right. That guy just fucking dominated the legend. But he stays on that path. He's going he to be, get better. Yeah. I, I, I don't, like I said, I don't think he's, he's reached his peak yet. Uh, Kudos to Johnny. Major congratulations to him. I mean, just an 
epic win for him. Really happy for him knowing the time and effort he puts in. Also, shout out to King Mo. We put a lot of time in with, with Johnny as Have well. Have you ever seen somebody as excited in a corner as King Mo between the fourth and fifth round? And I was telling you about it because I was sitting right, right there, you know, inside the fencing yes. area right behind the corner. And I saw it. I didn't realize they showed it on TV. You're like, yeah, I saw it. I'm like, how did you see it? Yeah. You know, and they actually they, showed it when I went back and watched the fight. Because I, I went back to watch the fight just to make sure he looked as good as I thought he looked. He right. fucking looked even better on TV than I, he did live. I mean, Mo's been around the block not only as a fighter, and sometimes Mo comes off as aloof to people, right? It's done it to us before. But, I mean, that's just Mo's personality, right? He's not the most enthusiastic guy. You know, sometimes unless you're talking the fight game with him, then you see his eyes light up. And uh, see his reaction with Johnny because he's kind of taking him under his wing. Uh, for those who don't know, Mo, Mo fought in Bellator. He's he's fought Musasi. He's fought everywhere. He beat Musasi for the Strike Force belt, which right. is interesting because after that fight, somebody texted me and said, "Wow, I had no idea Mo, Mo beat Musasi for the Strike Force belt back way back, way back when." Which I was there for that fight because I think I was thinking I cornered Bobby Lashley on that card. Okay, and my response was, "Yeah, you know, you know who else he beat for a belt?" And they're like, "Who? Yuri? Like, Fucking Yuri? Yeah, Yuri. I mean, dude, Mo's a stud." 100%. Like I said, he's been around. He's fought in everything from Pride and Ryzen and, and, and Bellator and, and legends of this game. And to see him take Johnny under his wing and be as excited in, in that aspect. That was, was so cool to it, me. One of my highlights of that night was watching how excited Mo was. And, you know, you look at coaches, and in my opinion, the worst trait a coach can have is ego, even though everybody in the MMA game has a certain type of ego. They want to win. Um, I just think coaches have to you know, have to be in it for the fighter, not themselves. And ego implies yourself. Things revolve right. around you. Um, even though the, I, I want our coaches to be egotistical and want to win every fight and think they're the best coach and blah, blah, blah. But, dude, Mo was not excited for Mo. Mo was excited right. for Johnny. 100%. You know, and he, I love to see it. Yeah, I mean, he's a, a really, really good coach. Um, I've seen him coach some of our lower-level guys. Um and really impart some wisdom and take him under their wing. He does a really good job, and uh, he's just a, a, a really knowledgeable guy about the fight game, whether it's boxing, MMA, or pro wrestling on any of these. Well, you know why he became a coach on our team. We were, we were talking about Mo back when he was still fighting, and we're like, God damn, he may be the best teammate we have on our team. He's helping everybody. When he won that Ryzen title, that tournament against Yuri, I think he got on a plane that night, hit a red-eye flight after that fight to go to Vegas right. to corner somebody for a title fight. Which Mike Brown that, just did also that for we had. the UFC. He but did. Yeah. But, I'm th but that's when he's yes. fighting. He's not yes. getting paid for that. He's right. not a coach. And, and, and you were telling me how, what a great teammate he was. And I'm thinking, he's going to be a good coach. Yeah. You know? and, and, man. Yeah, his, knowledge right of the fight, yeah, his, his uh, knowledge of the fight game is pretty impressive. I like talking to Mo. Um, just in generalities about the fight game, um, super it's knowledgeable It's funny, you guy. think, Mo, you think, oh, you know, Olympic-level wrestler. He was at the Olympic Training Center for a Freestyle long time, league. really good in the NCAA. You think he's, dude, Mo's striking knowledge is as good as his MMA knowledge. He's watched every boxing match in the history of the world. He watches kickboxing yeah. shit. He knows all these guys. We get guys that come in the gym that are kickboxers, and Mo's like, oh, man, you got so-and-so. I'm like, how the fuck do you know that guy? Dude, I get some Russian guy that walks in here and right away, oh, yeah, I know him because I wrestled this coach over there, and I was over in uh, Dagestan, and yeah, yeah, Richie, look out for this guy. And I'm like, oh, shit, okay, cool. We got to get him on the show one time. We'll, we'll have a blast oh, talking. Oh, be great on the show. Um, but anyway... Um, Again, kudos to Big Johnny. Um, he pulled it out. Uh, another trophy, uh, you know, another belt in the trophy case here for us. Just a, a, a tremendous weekend overall for the team, and and for fight fans in general. Yeah, I want to. I know I want to toot our horn a little bit though, because <clears throat> we had what was it, seventeen fights, eighteen counting Armon. I just didn't do a training camp here, but if I'm just counting training camp guys here. 17 fights over two weeks. And out of those 17, Dan, it was big shows. It was Bellator. It was UFC and PFL. And the team came Yeah, you didn't count a couple guys that fought in some local shows. And it was 15 and 2 uh, overall. And this past weekend, we had both guys on main events. One's fighting for a title and a legend. And the other's two up-and-coming animals that are probably going to be future champs. And, uh, you know, team team walked away pretty good, man. And And... It's good, it's good to feel when you walk in here, the, the gym the next day, the energy and what goes on. And You know, we, you, you mentioned PFL. The one fight that we had this weekend in Cleetson. the PFL was Cleetson Abreu fighting against Hennen Ferreira. Hennen was minus 1,000 yeah. going into that fight. Now, Hennen looked out of shape. I think he took – I think he was just supremely overconfident, got got tired. But, you know, props to Cleetson. He goes in there. Hennen Ferreira is a 
scary heavyweight. Yeah, I know. When they and dominated his, him. Yeah, when they announced this fight, I'm like, man, that's a fucking tough matchup. Um, but Cleetson exposed him. I mean, he took him to the ground, grinded him out, just – Look good. Yeah, just took him out. We we spent an hour just talking about the UFC and a couple guys and, and Bellator. We're like, you know, an hour into our show. We didn't really get to talk about last week's PFL. A um, couple upsets there. But anyway, let's just jump forward and try to blow out what we got coming up this week. We got a PFL this week with Kayla Harrison on there. She had an opponent change. It was Julia Budd originally. Opponent pulled out. I don't know why. Um, and now she's got a new opponent. Which, which is which is a shame because I know how excited Kayla was to fight somebody who's a former Bellator champion. Yes, <clears throat> because uh, you know Kayla, Kayla really wants she wants name sh- name name fighters. Man, she wants to show what she can do. She thinks she can beat any female in the world, and, and she most, thinks she could beat any male in the men. world. Yeah. That's where I was going. Yeah, so I know she was really excited for that, but she still got you know she's got a fight. She's going to move on. I think she's going to win that fight. I think she's going to dominate that fight, like I thought she was going to against Julia Budd. Agreed. Um, Next fight, we we have two Magomeds on that car, and I love both these guys. Former champ Magomed, Magomed Karamov is on there, and he's fighting Zhao Zeferino. Who's Dude, a really Zeferino good is good. Really good jiu-jitsu guy, guy. Good, good striker, tough guy. Um, I, I look for Magomed to pull out the W on this one. I think he's a little bit more polished in, in, in all the aspects. Oh, I think I think he's the better fighter. I think he's going to win. Unfortunately, he missed his first fight with some visa issues, yep. so he, he needs points, yep. which means he needs an early finish. And Zhao Zeferino doesn't get finished early. That's I know. Not, it's just not going to be an easy task. It's funny because Magomed did that last year. He missed the first fight and then got six points in his next fight to, to cruise on. Hit an Ezekiel finals. from inside the guard. Love it. I think I learned that from uh, Alexi Olenek. Dude, but, but from inside the guard? Yeah, I mean, sick. I looked at that. I was like, what are you out of your mind? I even asked Padumpa because I know he coaches him. And I'm like, dude, he hit that from inside the guy's guard. And I said, what the fuck is that? And Padumpa said, I saw him do that in the gym. And I'm thinking, that's bullshit. That's yeah. bullshit. That's 10 cent. That's dime bullshit. Then he did it to me. Yeah. And Pato was like, he that's, got me. He's like, he fucking got me with it. I'm like, holy shit. That's, that's dollar bullshit now. Yeah, and right? We also have Magomed Umlatov on there. Uh, really tough kid. He's undefeated, 11-0. and 0. Um, he's, in, he's on the prelim card. I he, don't he's think got he can, a tough opponent as well. That guy's 18-3. and three. Yeah, I don't think he can make the tournament. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I, I, he was an alternate, and I don't even think this is a tournament fight, is it? I, I don't know, so um, I'm not sure. Uh, apologies, I'm not. But he's got zero beforehand. points after the first round because he didn't fight in the first round, right? So. But he's a really tough dude. Looking forward to seeing his fight. Um, Going to jump on over to the UFC. Um, Coming up, yeah. skip over the he, UFC. Yeah. <clears throat> Izzy is the main event on this card. Coming up, we're going out there to watch Pedro Munoz and. Uh, Sugar, Sh- I say, Sean O'Malley. Yeah, I always say Sugar Shane. Yeah, Sugar, you know, Shane O'Malley. Um, but uh, Cannoneer against Izzy. I think Izzy's going to take this fight. Dude, Cannoneer's a scary dude. He is. Um, I don't know. I just think Izzy's striking is you know, going to be the difference. <clears throat> His movement, he's, a, he's probably had a really good camp because he's in the, probably in the same camp that Volkanovsky's in. They're probably training if, together. If, as if a you team look thing. at the odds, though, Cannoneer is a massive underdog. He's like, he's. Uh, yeah, I'm not talking three, from a betting perspective, but, yeah, but you're right. And <clears throat> if you look at the guys that you know Izzy's had lately, a lot of the guys are you know rightfully concerned about his striking, and a lot of them kind of stay away. You know, like Paulo Costa just kind of stayed a distance, and Izzy just picked him apart. You know, Joel Romero in that fight kind of stayed away, and Izzy you know, nobody picked anybody apart in the fight. It was That's a terrible fight. fight of all time, but. Conor is not going to stay at distance of this guy. Conor is going to come in and try to take his head off. He has nothing to so lose. It's going to be an interesting fight. If it that guy be. lands, if that guy gets on top of you, he is just – he's a scary – different levels of scary guys on top of you. You never right. want to be on your back in a fight. But some guys, you know, you're just going to get laid and prayed. Some guys, you know, are going to have some you – in know, a little intermittent body-body head. Conor Nears looking to squash you. Yeah, some so guys that, are going to have I, I'm interested in that fight. If I had to bet on that fight – I'd try to play the parlay game and play those odds because he right. can absolutely win that fight. Um, next up next up is just another barn burner of a fight with Max Holloway and Volkanovski. Uh, obviously, Volk has two decision wins over Max, one of them being a little controversial. I thought Max won it. I um, said earlier that Charles Oliveira is my favorite fighter to watch of all time. Max is your second. Max is number two. Yeah. I <laughs> love Max Holloway. You know, it's funny. Uh, I think Max is great. Love watching Max fight. think that kid's a a future Hall of Famer, if not already one. Uh, Volkanovski just keeps growing on me. The more I watch him fight, the more impressed I am. The guy is a killer. His cardio, his ground and pound, submission defense against Ortega when he got caught and stuff. It's like Fight IQ. If Ortega can't catch you in something that's locked in, who right. can? Right. Not, 
you know, some guys get a guillotine, but you see kind of half outs, you know, you're able to fight the hands or heads. When it's locked in, you're done. Forget it. You're on a normal guy. With but Ortega, it's, it's, it should be over with. But it's locked in with Ortega, who's yeah. one of the only two guys, I think, that really can finish high-level dudes on their back. Super impressive um, that these guys are going to go out and Can't again. wait for that fight. Yeah. You, you know, know what's crazy? If Holloway wins, which, pff, who's to say Holloway can't win that fight? Right. A lot of people thought he won the second fight, you know, um, he wins that fight, there'll probably be a fourth one. How could you deny it? And who it? doesn't want to see it? And how could you deny it? I guess it depends on how it finishes. Usually right? at the end of trilogies, people are like, God, I never want to see those two guys fight again. I don't even want to see them on the same card right. just in case there's an injury and they end up having to fight each other again. Dude, I would watch those two guys fight every weekend for the rest of my life. <clears throat> I'm with you on that one. Another one I'm looking forward to is Alex Pereira, who had beaten Izzy in a kickboxing fight, trains with Glover Teixeira, really high-level striker against Sean Strickland, who's just a madman, and uh, I think is going to go right at him, and I'm really looking forward to see this fight. Man. That's going to be a really interesting fight. I actually sat with Ed Soros, who manages Pereira at the Bellator show, and I asked him about Pereira, and I said, how's his, how's his takedown defense, and how's he getting up? And Soros is like, a lot better than people think. So, And again, do I think Sean Strickland's going to go in there and take him down? I mean, you were commenting to me about how much better his grappling was than you thought it was because he doesn't really use it when he was down here. I mean, I don't know if he's going to look to take a guy down. Here. I, never, I, don't, I don't recall ever seeing trying to do it. But if there's ever a time to try to do it and, you know, try to fight to, your, to a bigger difference in your strength versus your opponent, it might make sense to try to do it, but I doubt he will. Dan, you know, it's funny. I think when you think of – I think when most people think of Sean Strickland, it's some of the outrageous things he says or some of the controversial things he says – and it takes away from his fighting ability. He just says what I'm always thinking. <laughs> uh, he is s fucking legit. He's a legit guy. The more I watch Sean fight too, it's the more I realize, man, this the more I watch him train here, I realize, man, this kid's got a real overall skill set, mentally tough guy. I think he throws shit out there just to tweak people and piss them off, which is even funnier at times. But, uh, man, that, that guy's going to be a problem. I like Sean in this fight. Um, gonna look at, Really looking forward to that. We're going out there also. We're going to go look for our boy, Pedro Munoz. He's the only guy we got on our card. It almost feels like a week. Uh, week off because you only got one guy fighting? Yeah, you know. Uh, it's really light. We only got Pedro on the card fighting Sean O'Malley, who's got a tremendous hype behind him. Curious to see because Pedro's not fucking taking a backward step against anybody. I go to all Pedro's fights. Yeah. A, a, I think he's going to be a stud coach for us forever. And B, he's just so fun to watch yeah. fight. He is a killer. Great dude. Great attitude. We just saw him here before here smiling, laughing, having fun. Um, really looking forward to, to seeing his, uh, his fight against Shane, Shane, uh, Sean O'Malley. I'm sorry. Uh, there's another fight on this card that I'm really looking forward to seeing. And I think it got dropped to the uh, prelims. And I think it's the lead in the last fight on the prelims is a law against Barbarino. Um, you know, if we're going to speak honestly and openly and frankly, you know, Lawler's not the same fighter he was. He's a little oh, bit on, yeah, he's on, the, on the downslope of his career, still has big power. I know Robbie likes to keep himself in shape. He always does. Um, uh, phys physically in shape, and he loves to loves to throw. He's a smart kid, and uh, Brian Barbarino, though, it fucking it just seems like it's every fight with him is a little bit of a war. And I see another war here, but I see Barbarino pulling it out. I think he's a slight dog against Lawler, uh, but I see Barbarino pulling out. You, I mean, uh, what's your thoughts on it? I mean, you can't deny that over his last several fights, Lawler's output has gone down significantly. Yes, yes. You know, it's just when guys are busy in front of him, he isn't firing back like he used to fire back. Was it probably 36 years old? I don't know. Probably in that area. But, 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 but a lot of wars, I would but think. But he, he didn't really fire back a lot against Colby when, when, when they fought. Colby was just volume. throwing such crazy volume. You know, Colby's, 40, not, okay. Colby's not known for his power, you know. Um, but Lawler wasn't really shoot, throwing back. But you might think, oh, yeah, but Colby's got the wrestling. You know, he's throwing, hoping that Robbie goes to counter so he can take him down. So you kind of understood it even though it's not a recipe for winning, you know. But then like when you watch the Magny fight, you know, there was just huge output by Magny and not a lot of output by Lawler in that in that fight. And then, like, I, I think when the third round started, Lawler started the round, came out strong and landed a big shot, and Magny immediately went to his ass, and Lawler let him up. But then Magny got busy, and Lawler kind of didn't throw a lot of output after that. So <clears throat> I'm not exactly sure why that is, but Barbarino – is not just trying to throw output for the sake of throwing output to either confuse you or try to accumulate damage like a Magni does right. and, and like a Colby does or to set up takedowns or what have you. Barbarino's coming to try to take your head off. And he's exactly. getting right in your face, right in the pocket. So I think that's going to force Lawler 
to fire back. I just can't imagine Lawler letting this guy in his face throwing bombs and not trying to throw bombs back. So <laughs> that's going to be a fun fight to watch. Yeah. I don't think that I don't think that one's going the distance. Right. And, you know, it's interesting. I think Barbarino starts a little bit slow, and I noticed in Robbie's last few fights, he's been starting fast, coming out pretty strong right away. Um, so it's going to be outside interesting. outside of the Magni fight where he didn't. Right. So it's going to be interesting <clears> to see how that plays out just the opening minute opening Dude, minute and a half of that fight I think fight. it's going to be on your marks get set go and I think they're coming in the middle if probably, I'm Barbarino, I'd pro- be th- I, I, probably initiated by Barbarino yeah. Robbie's a smart fighter he, he he knows what's going to happen he knows what's going on he knows what guys tendencies are I think he expects Barbarino to come right at him so it's going to be interesting to see what he does you know is he going to try Robbie's to- going to sit down and throw I would imagine you have to against this guy yeah. but I don't know yeah we'll I mean, see I, I would have thought he would have been busier against Magny Without the real threat of big knockout power right. coming from me, I'm not going to let Neil Magny just set me up and you know pepper me, pepper me, take me down. But he kind of did, you know. So I don't know, but uh, it's going to be a fun fight to watch. Right. Um, can't wait to get out there. Um, but I'm going to throw it off now for our, you know we're going into <clears throat> over an hour. I was trying to I was going to try to keep it succinct, but not today. One but, one last thing. Go ahead. Donald Cerrone, Jim Miller. Okay. Has now been added to the card. Aren't they what, tied for one and two or two and three for most wins in the history of the UFC? And, and probably most submissions too, right? Somewhere oh, God. Along the line. I don't think people realize how many wins Miller has and how many wins he has by submission. How many years have they been in the UFC? Forever. The, the, the longevity speaks to their career, how good both of those guys are. Especially at 155 because it's such a competitive division with such stud athletes in there. And these guys are still there. Um, that's going to be just, that's just a cool fight. Yeah, it is. You know, that's a super cool fight for me. That's the kind of fight when you see those guys go to the cage, you're like, wow, there's a couple studs right there. Anybody you like in that fight? Yeah, if I, I think Miller still has more of the old Jim Miller than Donald Cerrone has of the old Donald Cerrone. Agreed. You know, even though Cerrone was a bigger star, obviously. Yep. Um, I, I think Jim Miller wins that yeah, fight. And the odds I, I'd be that. surprised if he wasn't a big favorite. Um, minus 210. Yeah. That's a pretty significant favorite. Yeah. You're two to one, you know? Um. Let's just jump to a new segment I'm going to put in here, stock up or stock down. I know, okay. Um, you know, thanks to Joe Biden, most of it is down. But let's just talk as it relates. That's Joe Biden to- stock way down. Yeah. So, so I'll, give, I'll throw out a few names to you. You can just tell me if stock up, down, neutral. Um, Armand Tazerkian coming off a loss. Up, which I had a big fear going into that fight that, that it would be a great fight, but somebody would really lo- be looked at poorly losing to a guy outside the top ten. I think everybody realized how great both those guys are, and that's one of the rare instances where both guys' stock is through the roof after that fight, especially amongst people who know and the people at the UFC know. Girgard Musasi losing uh, a legend like Girgard losing his title over the weekend. I'm gonna say I'm gonna say down just because I don't think anybody wants to see that rematch. So nobody wants to see Girgard get a, a rematch for that title. So I don't see him fighting for the title anytime soon. So that's that's a negative for him. Does this do anything to put a dent in his status or his legacy as a, as a legend of the sport? Absolutely not. You know, he just fought against the younger, hungrier lion who, you Changing know. Changing of the guard. Who, yeah. Yeah. Changing of the gay guard. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Pettis, he lost by a, I think it was a twister, like a reverse twister or something over in PFL. He's now yeah. one and three in PFL. He lost his fight. Uh, he's a former champ. Stock up, stock down, Dad. Way down. Yeah, I mean, he was one and three in the PFL, um, and and he lost, you know, to a couple of guys who are not established stars. You know, um, Stevie Steve, Ray. Stevie Ray's Most not, you know, know not a is. lot of hot behind Stevie Ray. Yeah. Um, you know, when he lost to Clay Collard, you know, Collard was kind of an unknown, but he's tough as shit, and he, he gained a little steam after that. People realized how good he was. He lost to Raouche, you know, last year, but Raouche went on to win the tournament. You know, so you could kind of justify, well, it's the champion that he that that he lost to, but. And then I was lost to Stevie Ray, who, you know, doesn't have a lot of hype behind him. I don't think Stevie Ray's going to win this tournament. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think stock way down on Sergio Pettis. Yeah. And just speak- I'm sorry, uh, Anthony Pettis. Anthony Pettis. And just speaking about that, it's it's kind of a little bit of a shame. So Pettis has lo- is losing. He's going to move on into this tournament. Raouche, who's uh, one and one. He's out. Nat- Pettis has more points, right? Because he got the finish, right? Natan is out. Cleats and Abreu, who just beat. Um, that's, Pennant Ferreira, that's unfortunate. He's two and zero in the PFL, and he's not even in the tournament. <laughs> and he beats this guy head to head, and this guy's in the tournament. He's not. So that's a little bit of a travesty there. You know, again, you have to. It's like the NFL playoffs. You you got to come up with tiebreakers, and there could be multiple teams involved in the tiebreakers. So how do you come out to something that's fair 
among everybody. Um, but if you get two teams tied in the NFL for the playoff, the first the first tiebreakers head to head, you know. Yeah. Um, or if, if you're not in the same division, right? Um, it's head to head. So you've got Klitson, who's two and zero. He's won both his fights, and you've got Henan Ferreira, who was the favorite going in, who won one fight, lost one fight. They both have six points because Klitson got two two wins by decision. Uh, whereas Ferrer had one win by first round knockout and one loss. So it's six points for the first round knockout and it's six points for the two wins. You would think that if two people have equal points, that the first tiebreaker would be record. If one guy's undefeated and one guy's one and one, you would think the undefeated guy w- would be ahead. But if not, head to head should mean something. If you if there's only two guys looking for a playoff spot and they fought each other and one won, one got the win, he should win. He won every second of every minute of every round against yeah. Hennon. But Henning gets in because he had the finish, but that doesn't have anything to do with the quality of that finish. We were talking earlier about, you know, you look at the quality of the win versus who you won. Johnny right. Eblem, you know, that's a real world championship because he beat a real world champion and a legend for that title. It means a lot more than someone who beat someone who kind of fluked his way into a belt right. in some division. You know, Henning Ferrer got his first round win. I don't even know who he beat for that first round win. He could have beaten a guy who's not very good. Right. Yet that carries the day and puts him into the playoffs over a guy who's got two wins plus a win over Henning. I don't think that's fair. Now, when you figure in there may be a four-way tie for it, so you really can't put that first, but there wasn't a four-way tie for it. You know, it was a two-way tie right. for it. So I think that's a bum deal for Clayton. Feel bad for him, but uh, is what it is, right? Yeah. I mean, they both got six points, and uh, Cleats Ka- is on Capelosi's one and one. Yeah. You know, his former champ, one and one, though, but six points for a first-round finish. Right. That means more than Cleatson's. You know, I just, eh, I, uh, I, I don't like it. Feel bad for Cleetson. I do you know, too. Two and zero, oh, and and, you, and you're on the outside looking in. But things happen sometimes in tournaments where guys pull out or whatever the reason is. So 100%. Hopefully, hopefully we'll be able to slide in there. Um, anything else, Dan? Man, just a just big big weekend of fights this past weekend, and a big weekend of fights next weekend. And it's it's not necessarily because there are fights. You know, Kayla Harrison is going to be a monster favorite in the main event of right. PFL. Pedro and O'Malley are going to be – it's going to be an amazing fight. Obviously, O'Malley's got all the hype in the world, and Pedro's so good. But, man, the the, the Volkanovski and Holloway fight Who looking got forward me, to that. got me so excited. You know, we have yeah. no ties to either guy. Neither one's ever stepped foot in this gym. I love Max Holloway. He's a, he's just such a – you know, such an all-time favorite of mine. He's in my top five, five fighters of all time. You know, not just being favorite fighter, I just think – He's a top five fighter right. of all time, whereas Charles Oliveira is my favorite fighter of all time, but not a top five fighter of all time yet. Um, so, so excited for Max and Volkanovski. And, uh, and I think Izzy and Conanier is going to be a good fight, too. So I'm pumped. Yeah, great weekend of fights. Uh, looking forward to going out there and watching them live. Um, but great, great two weeks. Gave our coaches off. Uh, today from, from a coach yeah, called off the coaches meeting yeah, today. Everybody's I mean, just so home. much traveling from the guys and just so much intensity and energy spent and I'm sure everybody's like man I need to relax a little bit you know so um, great great week for the team super pumped for everybody happy for everybody and uh, that's all I got anything for you nope I'm fucking hungry let's go eat alright we're out guys hey just in the comment section let us know what you thought on the Gamrod fight uh, if you thought he won if you thought Armand won I know there's a lot of uh, Fervent fans, whether you're from Poland, Armenia, and Russia and all that, just curious to everybody what, what you guys thought of that fight. So uh, look forward to hearing those comments. So appreciate everybody following us and the support. We are out. <laughs> <laughs>